Everything we sense is an illusion. Everything we sense is deception. Sounds like The Matrix or The Truman Show. But it's actually Plato almost two and a half thousand years ago. So does reality exist? And if it does, what is it? Plato's philosophy. Part one, the allegory of the cave. Plato attempts to explain reality by giving us an allegory, a story meant to reveal deeper truths. The story is presented in book six of his celebrated work, Republic, as a dialogue between Glaucon, who's Plato's brother, and Socrates, Plato's teacher. It goes something like this. Imagine a group of prisoners who have spent their whole lives in a cave chained facing a wall. They cannot, nor were they ever able to, look around the cave at each other or themselves. Stiff and inflexible, their whole existence consists of sitting down, watching shadows dancing on a wall in front of them. There are shadows of people, household objects, trees, and so on. These shadows are thrown on the wall by a fire behind them, which they have never seen, and in front of which cut out images are paraded. For the prisoners, the shadows are all that there is. They constitute the totality of their reality. Now imagine one of them breaks free from the shackles. Unbound, he stretches his stiffened limbs for the first time. Turning his head around for the first time, blinded by a flame he sees for the first time. As his eyes adjust, he makes his way through the cave, eventually getting to the entrance, where he gets to see the rest of reality. This prisoner sees real people, real trees, real birds and the blazing sun. He recognizes the outside world as superior to what he experienced in the cave. Excited, he wants to share the news, so he returns to the cave to tell his confined companions about what he seen. However, the others think him mad. They are comfortable in the cave. It is their safe zone. It is the only zone that they know. If they were able to, they would try and get rid of, perhaps kill, anyone trying to drag them out. Plato, through Socrates, uses the different characters and objects in the allegory as metaphorical devices. The cave represents the physical world, that is, the world that we know. It is a weaker world that hosts the senses. It is also not a place where people can obtain knowledge of true reality. The prisoners are people untutored in philosophy. They are bound to a worldly, temporal and perishable existence, a mere imitation of true reality. The shadows are the temporal objects we know through the senses. The freed prisoner is the philosopher, seeking true knowledge outside the cave of enslavement. Part 2. The Theory of Forms Plato's theory of forms, or theory of ideas, is his view that the physical world is not as real or as true as timeless, absolute ideas. The physical realm of things, the one we experience through our senses, is only a shadow or image of the true reality of the realm of forms. These forms, or ideas, are concepts that are perfect, abstract, unchanging, non-physical and universal. If we want to truly understand reality, we have to understand the forms. Through this, we gain knowledge. Understanding happens when we grasp the world of forms with our mind. Let's take homemade biscuits as an example. The baker starts with the idea of making biscuits. Those biscuits in the baker's head are the perfect version of the biscuit. They have the right texture, smell, taste, consistency, shape, and so on. They are, after all, an idea. They're the idea or form of a biscuit. 
And then the baker prepares the dough, cuts the biscuits and bakes them. And we end up with biscuits that we can perceive through our senses. While they are alike, on close inspection we notice that no two biscuits are actually identical. Some may be slightly more toasted, others a bit more cracked, still others more or less inflated or deflated. There are variations because they are imperfect copies of the perfect ideal former biscuits in the baker's head. Let's take another example. The ideal triangle is the form of a triangle. Only by grasping the idea of what a triangle should look like, that is, a geometric shape having three sides, can we then see a drawing of a triangle on a chalkboard and recognize it as being an image of a triangle. The triangle as it is on the chalkboard is an imperfect, impermanent copy of the ideal triangle. The perfect triangle is one existing outside of space. It exists as an idea. Similarly, the ideas of justice, goodness, equality, truth and beauty are, according to Plato, true, a spatial reality. They exist as ideas but outside of concrete space. According to Plato, the form of the good in particular is the most important. It is the one form that allows us to understand everything else. It provides knowledge and truth. Plato's theory of forms sheds light on his ideas about the soul. He claims that the body and the soul are distinct. First to exist is the soul or psyche and it is internal and immortal. It survives beyond the death of the body. Moreover, it is that which makes us behave the way we do. The body, on the other hand, is perishable. In fact, he considers the body to be the prison of the soul, trapping what is permanent in a cage of impermanence. In Plato's Republic, in dialogue between Glaucon and Adeimantus, Socrates tries to determine whether the soul consists of one or several parts. He argues that if it consists of one part, then it is difficult to explain how we sometimes want contradictory things. For instance, we may be tempted to steal something, to take something which isn't ours. At the same time, we may feel reluctant to take it. The theory of non-contradiction states that contradicting propositions, for example, I want it and I don't want it, are mutually exclusive. They cannot be true in the same sense at the same time. Following this line of thought, therefore, a soul that consists of only one part cannot concurrently hold this contradiction. And this leaves us with a soul made of multiple parts, with Socrates arguing that there are three such distinction, what he calls the tripartite soul. So, the three parts of the soul would be first, the logical or rational part, second, the spirited part, and third, the appetitive part. From one person to the next, these three parts are in different balances. These differences in balances make us who we are. They are responsible for why we act the way we do. And to describe how these three parts work together, Plato again uses an allegory, what he calls the allegory of the chariot. Now imagine a charioteer driving a chariot pulled by two horses with very different characters. One horse stands for the spirited or lively part of the soul and embodies passion and hot-bloodedness. The spirited part loves being challenged and it's angered by injustice and cruelty. It's impulsive, but it is rationally <clears throat> and morally impulsive, keen on the positive part of passionate nature. The other horse stands for the appetitive part of the soul, seeking irrational passions and appetites. From its stem are drive for pleasure, security and comfort. It drives our libido and makes us seek food, safety and most notably money. The charioteer is the logical or rational part. It judges what is best and true for us. 
It's part of the psyche that analyzes and looks ahead. It rationally weighs options and drives the chariot. It is the part that should be in charge. Both the charioteer and the horses, though, need each other. A charioteer without horses cannot move, and horses without a charioteer will run wild. And this way Plato explains how the rational part of our soul needs the appetitive and spirited parts to drive it, whereas the other two need the rational part for guidance and to make good decisions. A balance between the three helps us live a morally fulfilled life. Every individual and every soul is not the same, with different balances in the tripartite soul giving us different behaviors. However, if we are to become the best persons we can be, we need to look at how to become virtuous. In the Republic, Plato identifies four cardinal virtues, wisdom, temperance or self-control, courage and justice. In the Protagoras, he also identifies a fifth one, piety. And for an interesting discussion on the meaning of piety, I would suggest reading Plato's Euthyphro. The cardinal virtues reflect the nature of the soul. It is by pursuing these that we can hope to become the best we can possibly be. Part 4. The city-state as a large soul, or the state as man writ large. Plato also uses the idea of the tripartite soul in his political philosophy to explain his perspective of what the ideal state should look like, seeing in the latter a sort of magnified version of the individual. He draws parallels between the three parts of the psyche and the three parts he thinks make up the ideal city-state, with each of these being made of a certain type of people. What he calls men of reason should be the ones who rule. The soldiers and guardians of the city-state are called auxiliaries and should be men of courage. Men of appetite are artisans and workers skilled in a trade, such as craftsmen or farmers. As with the soul, the city-state's version of courage and appetite should be governed by reason, whom he identifies as the philosopher king. According to Plato, philosophers make the best rulers because they possess a devotion to wisdom. They also possess intelligence, reliability and the willingness to live a simple life. Prizing reason and wisdom, the philosopher king can understand true goodness and justice in a way that other people cannot. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more videos and to support more content. Till next time.